session here is talk through from an acquisition perspective uh, where we are in certain areas, particularly as they align to what we've been talking about in this conference, which is uh, collaborations with industry, ways we're, we're, we're attempting to bend the cost curve and do cost savings, and innovation uh, along the lines of what the chief introduced yesterday. Um, so I'm going to do this within the framework of our acquisition priorities just to kind of set everybody um, and hopefully give you um, a little bit more meat on the bones in what we're doing and planning to do in a couple of these areas. And then I'll, I'll take uh, all the very hard questions at the very end. So that's the plan. Slide. So we have had established five acquisition priorities uh, in the Air Force that we've been marching to and we've been measuring ourselves against and they're listed here. Some of you who've heard us speak before have seen these. Um, you're gonna see three of them are bolded. Those are the ones I'm gonna go into and give you some meat on the bones on what's going on. But I wanna highlight all five to remind ourselves. The first one is kind of self-evident. We have the big three programs that we talk about all the time, the KC-46, the F-35, and the LRSB. We have the programs that we're getting started, the TXs, the JSTARS recap. Um, that's our daily ops, that's our AOR. <laughs> If we have to do that, we have to do that right, and we can't forget that. So that's all I'm going to say about that priority in this briefing, because hopefully all of you know the status of most of those programs. But I, I will talk in this briefing, though, about the second bullet. We have really put effort into trying to make ourselves more transparent. Acquisition is hard to understand. It's filled with acronyms. It's filled with lots of history. Uh, we've all experienced various parts of the system. And we don't talk about it clearly well enough. And we also have not been as, as collaborative with industry in the past as we would have liked to have been. So we've really put effort into this under the leadership of the secretary and the chief. And I'm going to talk about a particular part of that second uh, priority called bending the cost curve and show you some, some of what's going on there. The third one I'm not going to talk about, but it's very important. The third bullet talks about basically bringing our program offices and their teams up to the high standards that they need to be at to run our programs. I think all of you in industry would agree uh, it's better to work for a very strong program office than a weak one. Uh, the old saying goes, A's hire A's, B's hire C's. Well, that applies to program offices with industry. So we're doing a systemic effort across the Air Force to assess the, con the competence of the program office and the skill sets. We call it owning the technical baseline. Think about it as, if the, as the program office being able to run the technical models of the system, uh, have the integrated master schedule, understand the interfaces, the ICDs, have the access to the data of the systems it's replacing. That's what fundamentally what is needed to be a competent program office, and we call it owning the technical baseline. So we're systemically going through the Air Force right now in our big programs, assessing and addressing those shortfalls when we find them. I'm not going to say any more about that in this talk. The fourth and the fifth priorities are where I'm going to spend the rest of the talk after, uh, after the second one. The fourth one is I want to show this audience some tangible results that are happening as a result of the Better Buying Power initiatives. We're now on the 3.0 version of Better Buying Power, but I want to dig down a little bit and show this audience some of the successes we're having in the Air Force, and maybe you haven't heard about them, maybe you haven't talked about them enough. The fifth one is really to talk about our future. How are we positioning Air Force via acquisition to align with the strategic agility concept that the Secretary and the Chief have and to deal with the peer adversary that we all know we're going to be facing and this technological superiority issue? So that's, those are acquisition priorities. Now I'm going to go right into the briefing. Slide. So this is priority number two. Again, improving our relationships, our transparency, our credibility uh, with, with the outside world. I'm going to talk specifically about one initiative that was kicked off exactly one year ago, really almost today, here at AFA. The chief and the secretary both instinctively realized that we're not going to make progress together on bringing price down, bringing costs down, and innovating if, if we in the Air Force cannot have regular, meaningful conversations with industry. Conversations with industry and the government and acquisition tend to follow pendulums back and forth. There are times when it's very difficult, certainly if there's, a, if there's a source selection going on or if there's some contentious issue, conversations tend to get very limited. 
What we want to do is we want to make sure there's a regular venue for us to talk with each other outside the source selection or the competition process on any one program. We also want to collectively work on ideas, innovative ideas, to bring costs down. So that was the idea behind bending the cost curve. We're one year into it, and General, uh, Janet Wolfenberger and I have been working on this for the chief and the secretary, and we now have about nine active projects going on, and I'm going to talk about a few of them in a moment. Slide. So what this is, is again, a, a set of acquisition, we call them acquisition reform, I don't like that term because it's got a lot of meaning, some of it from the 90s that maybe we don't agree with. But basically what it is, is tangible projects focused on outcomes, measurable outcomes. They have three bins, those, those projects that are improving our internal processes that will help us and industry. The second is bringing industry in across the life cycle of the program. Importantly, even bringing industry in before we have a requirement. That is in the concept development phase. That's what we want to do all the way through life cycle, collaborate with industry. And the last bullet is let's get access to new, new parts of our industrial base, the Silicon Valleys, access to academia. What are the ways we can bring new folks in? Slide. This is a summary chart of all the projects. I'm not going to brief all of these projects. I'll just hit a few in this discussion just to give you a sense. Uh, the first bullet is, or the first uh, row is called IT Business Analytics. With AFSIA, we had a group go out and talk to the CIOs of non-DOD industry, the Fords, the banks, and stuff. And the first thing they told us is, if you want to make a difference in your IT and your business systems, you've got to know where your money is being spent. That is the most important thing. Call it business analytics. Sounds obvious, but it was something that we felt, well, let's, let's just put together an office that actually started with just one individual, and let's start finding where our money's being spent. I'm not kidding, within four months, we've identified about $200 million of ways we can, we can save money on how we buy our, 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 our computers, just by this one person going in and doing some, an, some analysis. So that, that's, a, that's a, a clear, low-hanging fruit, easy win for us. We're gonna continue to work on that. Uh, matchmaker, the next one's an interesting concept. Uh, this came from General Ellen Polakowski, who's the mill dep in AQ, some of you know her. Ellen, when she was at SMC, had had a great success working with her Lockheed uh, Space counterpart on the Sibbers program. They were able to, working together, really ba basically streamline the program, a lot of the documentation, what they call the CLINs in the, in the, in the contract, a lot of the uh, details of the work breakdown structure. In doing so, they were able to save a lot of money. I'm gonna show that later. So what we did with the leadership of Lockheed, and this was Ellen's idea, they said, with the leadership of Lockheed at the, at the enterprise level, let's take the teams in the Air Force that are working with Lockheed Aero, say C-130, and team them up with their Air Force counterparts and see if we can translate those best practices. Now you say to yourself, well, why, why do it within a company? Why don't you go across companies? Well, sure, you, need, you would like to do this across companies too, but think about it. Doing it within a company, we've got an ally. We've got the CEO and us together telling our teams do this best practice over here. And I will say, uh, just in discussing with Lockheed leadership at this conference, there is a preliminary plan to take some of these best practices with Lockheed and bring them to the F-35 Joint Program Office. The Joint Program Office has agreed to do that, so they're streamlining things. We're now doing this matchmaker. We're soliciting other projects across other corporations we have in the Air Force, and we're gonna be doing more of these. Uh, I won't spend any time on FMS efficiencies. You can just probably guess what it is by the title. Uh, the next one, best practices, is an attempt by uh, Janet Wolfenberger and I to bring down the timeline it takes to do award of contracts. It takes 17 months, 17 months, to award a single, a sole source contract in the Air Force from initial RFP through the award. Way, way too long. A lot of money is spent by industry, a lot of frustration on all sides. We put a Tiger team on this, I think with, with uh, industry associations, the NDIA, to look at what were the root causes. We found about 36 things that contributed to this, both in industry and on the government. So we are now putting those in place and we're gonna measure it. And our goal is to get the 17 month timeline down to single digits. I'm not gonna talk about uh, the next one because I'm gonna give you a little brief on it. I would just call out one more at the bottom. We uh, are, are taking a, a page out of the DARPA handbook on, on uh, acquisition challenge. Now, AFRL, and the AFRL commander is here, Tom Masiello, has done these technical challenges at smaller levels. We're raising this now at the enterprise level of the Air Force. Okay, and what we've picked is we've picked a hard problem. 
The hard problem being, can we build or produce? Can, can academia, can industry produce? Almost certainly it'll be a turbine engine that will have high efficiency, high efficiency of, of uh, lower power engines, but at the higher power. So we gave them an efficiency goal with a high power to weight, um, I mean, sorry, a high power to weight ratio. It picked a sweet spot that if we can pull this off, it'll have huge applicability across UAVs and commercially. It's gonna be a $2 million prize. It's gonna be announced in May. And our intention is, whoever wins this, you know, we're gonna put hooks in to transition this technology. And if you haven't paid attention to some of the DARPA challenges, uh, there was one they did recently on robotics. I think it was a million or $2 million award. It was calculated that there was about $93 million spent by industry and academia to win the one to $2 million award. So that's the idea here, is we're trying to capture imaginations, we're trying to bring new people in. So what I'm gonna do now is spend a, <clears throat> a little bit more time on two of these initiatives. Slide. Let's first talk about cost capability analysis. Okay, cost capability analysis we think is a fundamental tool to how we're going to buy cost-effective capabilities. We also think it's a tool that you and industry need. Oftentimes in industry, you tell us, rightfully so, set the requirements, give us a couple of years, let us understand what you're gonna value in the source selection. Well, it's not enough to do an AOA. It's not enough just to say, here's the threshold of, of, of requirement, here's the objective requirement. We have to know more, right? We have to know which of those means more to the warfighter, which, which is more valuable. Well, cost capability analysis is a way to determine that. We have started to pilot these, and more than pilot these in the Air Force for the last couple of years. But what we're now gonna do is we're now gonna be transparent with these and work with industry on them. And we're gonna pilot cost capability analysis on four projects, starting with TX. And this is gonna be collaborative with industry. Okay, so what I decided to do was to kind of basically walk you through what cost capability analysis is. I'm going to use an example that was done before. It's called F-15 EPAWS. F-15 EPAWS is a defensive system we were upgrading on the F-15. Okay, so let me show you how it basically works. Chart. Okay, so, so bear with me here. So what you see in these boxes here is something called Mission Task 2, Mission Task 1, Mission Task 3, Mission Task 4. In each one of these boxes, you have a graph. Utility, think of that as usefulness versus life cycle cost. Think of mission task as, say, mission task one might be air to air, mission task two might be air to ground, mission task three might be uh, availability, mission task four might be something else. These are mission tasks that the warfighter, in this case, ACC, cares about. And we have the cost of each one of these mission tasks across the x-axis. These dots represent various suites of capabilities to meet that utility. What you see in the big chart is with ACC, the analysts rolled them all up into an overall operational utility. Basically, if it's higher, the warfighter cares about it more. And of course, you have cost across the x-axis. Now, these dots represent spaces of available solutions, different solutions to put on F-15 to do the mission. And you see they, 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 they are kind of all over, right? There's a series of dots here that have different, different costs and capability, and then you have these dots connected by the line. Well, the doc, dots connected by the line are the most efficient solutions. The, the technical term it's, a, it's called is a Pareto front. Think of it as the efficient front. So if you have any solution along that line, you're, you're, you're at the top of the cost capability for what that capability is and that cost. So the first thing you learn from doing this is everything not on the line, you just get rid of it. You just get rid of it. So, let, so then what you do is you start looking at the line and saying, where does the warfighter care about? Where are they willing to pay for? Chart. So now look, we've removed the dots that were off the line. Then we've looked at the ones up here, and the warfighter has basically said, you know what? That knee in the curve, I'm not going to pay more than this capability. I don't get that much more. So these are unaffordable. Then the warfighter says, you know, I know that's a lot cheaper, but it's below what I want. So the warfighter is saying, look, this is the space I want to operate in. Now, this is a real example. I've taken the, we've taken the, the numbers off the, off the axes because of classification. This is a real example. So now, think about this. We can put together a cost capability type uh, RFP. This might be the threshold right there, but it shows what we're willing to pay extra for to get up to another capability. 
We could roll this in. We could give credit in dollars, for example, of somebody who goes up to this capability or even above if they're operating down here. If we do this with industry on programs like TX, there'll be a much better understanding and a way for us to know what we're paying for and willing to pay for. That's cost capability analysis. And as I said, we're going to do the pilots on, the, on these four programs. These all are different stages. Chart. OK, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is better buying power. A friend of mine came by my office a couple weeks ago. And it's always interesting to talk to friends of mine who are really savvy in the industry and what they see versus what I see and we all see in, the, in my job. And he said something to me like, well, co uh, should cost has kind of gone away, hasn't it? And I kind of was stunned when I heard that. I said, no, should cost has been one of the foundational better buying power principles since 1.0. I thought, maybe we're not talking about our successes. So let me tell you once again what should cost is. If we have a program, the pro all programs must have an independent cost estimate. That is by law, usually done either by CAPE or AFCA or both. Okay. Then, if it's a real program, us in the Air Force, the programmers, have to fund it. They have to put the money in, and it has to be funded to those independent cost estimates. Again, that's, that's, that's re required. What should cost does is once that's in the budget, then the industry and the program office go and attack those costs and, and try to beat them. And when they're validated and achieved, the money that was in the budget is available then to be taken back, and we have a set of governance rules, and they can be put back into the portfolio um, and or turn back to the Air Force corporate line. So let me give a couple of examples. I have like five examples. I'm only going to show three. Slide. So next slide. This is one that was done by Major General Scott Jansen, who's here, right here, uh, down in PEO Weapons. What Scott and his team did was they did a series of best practices across various programs, increasing competition, data-driven negotiations. What data-driven negotiations means is using actuals, using actuals. Uh, doing, doing larger buys. What you see, what they did, found on the right was, first of all, they got about um, th uh, 350 they were able to turn back to corporate Air Force. And then they were able to buy back a bunch of weapons. Look at the weapons that Scott and his team were able to buy back. The AMRAMs, uh, those are the uh, QF-16s are the targets. Um, this is just an example of what we're talking This is real, real money that was returned back both to the Air Force and to the warfighter in terms of capabilities. Slide. Here's space. I mentioned to you earlier the work that was done by General Polakowski and Lockheed Space on Sibbers. They've done incredible work over the last five or six years. Look at the numbers there, six, plus, six billion plus in savings. Now again, a lot of this was because the cost estimates, the independent cost estimates were done based upon history when things were quite expensive in space. So in some ways you could argue we had a, a low bar to get under to beat these cost estimates. But remember, we have to fund those cost estimates. So this is real money. And you can see the type of things that they did. Increased competition, efficiency. That efficiency is the matchmaker I was describing on Sibbers. Um, and then streamlining deliverables, that's also the Sibbers example. And, and look what we did. They were able to return $6 billion to the Air Force. And we've got a potential of $800 million more that we may achieve here. Slide. Here's battle management. This is uh, Steve Wirt up at Hanscom. Steve has got about $467 million already and he's tracking about the same amount of potential uh, in, in the same time period. And again, look what he did, increased competition. Look, at the, look what's right there, cost capability analysis. He used cost capability analysis, and he was able to put the money back into many of these programs. So it, it's this hard work that's going on that's kind of not being noticed that is, that is buying back weapons and mitigating the really tough uh, budget situation we're in. My estimate, and I wanted to have it for this talk, but I, I don't, is we've saved about $2 billion in real money over about this, this uh, five to six year period that we pumped back into the Air Force. Now, you have to think about this for a second and say, probably as we continue these best practices, we're probably not gonna continue to get these savings, right? Because the next time the independent cost estimates will be done, they're gonna use these best practices, right? And we're, we're driving these best practices into the culture so that this is the expectation. But for now, because the independent cost estimates are using a time frame before we were doing all this, we're reaping a lot of value out of this. So I wanted to show that to people just so they understand the success that's going on. And this is just one aspect of better buying power. Slide. 
So now let me finish by talking about this last priority, strategic agility. The Secretary and the Chief have rallied the strategy of the airport, Air Force around strategic agility. And I, I know, I hope all of you have read and heard about that. So people have asked us, and the Secretary has challenged us, what does strategic agility mean in acquisition? Um, I, I was really happy when we kind of got that question because um, some, and some of you know this, I was part of a group about four years ago that studied this exact problem on the Defense Science Board. It was called adaptability, but it was the same question. And here, here's what it means. First of all, what it means in acquisition. Agility, first of all, the fundamental metric of agility is, is speed, speed. You want to be fast. You want to be faster than the, the technology cycle time and be faster than the adversary. So if you can do things fast, that's agile. If you do things fast and you fail fast, that actually can be very agile. If you're going to fail, fail fast so that you can try something else. Failing slow is bad, OK? Failing slow is bad. Fail fast, that's OK. What the next thing is, if you can't do it fast, if it's not something amenable to a rapid acquisition, and face it, some of what we do is not amenable to that, then what you do is you build in the assumption that you're going to have to change or pivot the system. OK, assume that the capabilities that you designed at the beginning will have to be changed. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, it means don't design something with ex assuming exquisite knowledge of the threat. Design something with broader ability to adapt to a variety of changes in the threat, but go specifically for block upgrades, block upgrades, and open architectures. Block upgrades and open architectures. Do the first version at the 80% level, and then at each block that's put in, you adjust. Now, with block upgrades and open architectures, you can put in algorithms when the threat changes. You can change direction of sensors. If you need a different sensor, you put a different sensor on it. It's the key to adaptability. It's a key to adaptability. So that's what strategic agility means to us. And the final thing I want to say before I get into this more is strategic agility means we also have to deal with the unknown, and we have to assume that we're going to have to operate these systems in ways we will not predict. We're going to have the adversary do, doing things we can't predict. We're going to be in degraded environments. It's going to be used by the warfighter, discovered by the warfighter to be used in a very different way. So always think about experimenting and innovating as part of agility. So next slide. Now, one thing that I think that we in the Air Force do very well, and this gets back to what the chief said yesterday about the reset, is we're very good in our lines of business at taking the action strategies of what we do, finding the results, and adjusting. By the way, all of you in your organizations hopefully do this well. If you don't do this well in your organizations, your organization is not going to survive. This is your daily ops. Okay, this is your daily ops. This is, this is important. But what strategic agility and planning for our future means in the Air Force as we look ahead, as we look at its 25-year cycle is coming, we need to look at the next thing, is while we do this, while we, while we do this across the Air Force in space, in air combat, in mobility, we have to figure out to do, please hit the click, this outer loop, which is basically Let's reassess the problem and look at the fundamentals and make sure we're thinking of it right. Are our assumptions still correct? Where's the white space? How are we innovating? What we really want to do, and this is what the developmental planning effort that the chief talked about yesterday, is we want to bring at the enterprise level of the Air Force that double loop in. And it gets back to our roots in the Air Force. It's what General Schriever did. It's where we experiment, we innovate, and we find our future. We find it in technology, we find it in tactics, we find it in warfighter ideas and conops. And that's what we're introducing. Next slide. So the chief talked yesterday about capability uh, collaboration teams. So this is what a capability collaboration team would look like to do this, where one would start with a high priority enterprise capability gap. You put the team together. Look who's on the team and what types of things. Experimenting, prototyping, obviously different acquisition strategies, uh, TTPs and CONOPS and doctrine. And you clearly would have to bring talent together from across the Air Force. And you would have these CCTs address some of these gaps. Now, you may say to yourself, OK, that's nice. A CCT sounds like a good plan. Um, first of all, you have industry on there. Where's industry? Well, industry, we, we have industry engagement on there. Click. But really, industry can play a lot more than just industry engagement. Click. There's lots of places where industry can play. OK, so, here's a, so we're setting up this process, right? That's great. But, but how do you build content? How do you build content? 
this cannot be an IPT meeting uh, we, we, every week in Crystal City. Oh, it could be, but that's necessary but not sufficient. We actually have to have content. So how do we build content? Slide. So let me walk you through this for a second and bear with me. If you think about the idea of learning and innovating and experimenting, there's lots of literature on this, you basically have a continual process in learning and experimentation organizations where you innovate, evaluate, build, test, build, demonstrate, plan again. You go around this circle. Now, when you're doing that, you always have this conundrum, and let me talk about it in this way, two entry points. Let's talk about the green box up there. New, op new ops concepts are new technologies. How often do we hear this? 3D printing, or the, 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 the bug we heard yesterday was sensor rich and processing poor. Really cool, right? What do we do with that? Well, you have to put it into this process and figure it out. You have to experiment. What about over here? What about we have an anti-access problem? We have a new way that the adversary is doing electronic warfare or cyber. You put that problem in here and you go around. Now what spins out are con ops perhaps, mature concepts, gaps in S&T, and then what needs to be focused on and globally scanning for emerging technologies. You say to yourself, okay, fine, I get your circle, but there's something missing here. And what's missing is the jelly in the jelly donut. Click. You actually have to do work. <laughs> you have to do work. You have to actually experiment. You have to actually do online workshops, war games. You have to begin, you have to do analysis. You have to do modeling. You have to build prototypes and try them and see what works and fails. And then you have to fi figure out how the people play in, what type of talent you need. So this is what we need to set up to achieve what the chief is talking about, this basically this outer loop, so we can do the developmental planning for our future. Because without this, we cannot realize the strategic direction of our Air Force strategy. You know, the, it, I used to hear this a lot when I was outside the government, the biggest failure of strategic planning is not the strategic plan, it's the execution of it. So we have to do this to get, make, make this great vision of the Air Force real. Next chart. So let's make it real. The leadership of the Air Force selected, the first one we're going to do is going to be around Air Dominance 2030. Air Dominance 2030. And we're going to take, many of you are, are familiar with the work that DARPA has been doing with the Air Force and the services on Air Dominance Initiative. We're going to take a lot of that work. We're going to take work that is going to be happening in the future. And we've already had, we're already meeting with the leadership of DARPA on this with Frank Kendall. And some of you may have heard Frank talk about the Aerospace Innovation Initiative. And we're going to start doing this process I described on that, around Air Dominance 2030. And we're going to bring in um, all the technologists, the warfighter experts. We're not going to focus it on one platform. We're going to look at the family of systems. We're going to look at the kill chain. We'll look at innovation. And we're going to bring to the Air Force leadership planning choices out of this. And we're going to innovate and we're going to discover. We're going to put our own money against it. Industry, you're going to be involved. You'll have opportunities to be involved, to bring your own ideas, your own IRADs, and also to be funded by us or DARPA or ATNL. That's what we're doing. Okay, there's two others that are listed on here that are, we've not yet set up. Uh, we, the, the Air Force does want to do this kind of a process on strategic turrets. Uh, General Wilson's here. Uh, he's, he's kind of one of the persons thinking behind this. I think that's going to be focused around the ground-based part of, the, of, of our, our triad. Um, that's going to be set up later. We're thinking that if we do a third one, you can't probably do more than two or three, it would be a focus later this year around electronic warfare. Of course, electronic warfare is part of air superiority, but we, 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 we might do a special one to look at that. So this is real. This is real. We're going to do this. And the idea here is to achieve the strategic agility, to innovate, and to learn, and to build the Air Force of the future so we will be the best Air Force in 2030 and 2040. So that's what's going on in the last priority. Next slide. So I went through all five of these. I highlighted what we're doing in bending the cost curve. I would say that we at this conference just yesterday had a great session with many of your leaders on what the next round of bending the cost curve ideas are. We've got four or five really good ideas. So we're going to roll out those, or you're going to continue to see more. I would also say one thing that I, I didn't really mention on there. We're also doing, in bending the cost curve, an innovative um, acquisition approach called PlugFest Plus, where we're going to bring with DCGS we're going to use other transactional authority and allow vendors to basically come in, show off their wares, plug in, and we'll be able to get them on contract within one or two weeks and so that they can, um, 
they can basically show us and we can bring it into our open architecture. So there's a lot going on in the second bullet that I haven't even talked about here. And then third, I showed you, I showed you should cost, but there's a lot more under, under, under that. And then finally, kind of our thoughts about the long-term strategy. So let me show you just some, some links to things. I, you don't have to write these down. We're gonna post this briefing on our website. But if, if you haven't read it, please read the Air Force strategy. Um, this you can just read so I'm not, so I feel like we put a lot of work in, but this is 400 pages, so it's kind of boring, but it just it'd make me feel better if you read it. But actually, <laughs> this one, and, and I'm not being falsely modest, Richard Danzig took our work and other people's work and wrote something that is just an incredible document. You need to read it. It's not long, it's like 40 pages, called Driving in the Dark, and it exactly describes what the Secretary and the Chief are talking about and what we're talking about here, about the need for strategic agility. If you read anything on this, read that third bullet, and, and just, it's online, it's incredible. This fourth one is the study that the National Academy has just published by Paul Kaminsky and Claude Bolton that gives the intellect behind the developmental planning, where they went around to the Air Force, they talked to us, and they recommended back. You saw in the Chief's brief yesterday, he showed that kind of almost looked like a key, a key on developmental planning, remember that, that shape chart? That is from that report. Read this report. Now, this last one I just put up a little bit just to remind people that sometimes things are hiding in plain sight. Frank Kendall produces these acquisition annual reports, and I don't know that people are reading them the way they should, because they kind of are all this type of analysis about cost plus versus fixed price, about where we are in development programs, and I still hear people debating things that a lot of them are answered in these reports with empirical data. So I'm, maybe just because I'm, I'm trying to help Frank, maybe click on, get, get him some page clicks right there. So anyway, I'm gonna post these. We're gonna post these on the AQ and, and I'd recommend you read that. I think I'm, I'm done with my, uh, my planned remarks. Uh, maybe we have some time for some questions. So thank you. Thanks very much. I want to start off with two questions that are somewhat related because they both uh, have to do with risk. Uh, the first is that uh, Frank Kendall said that there are so few new programs anymore uh, that industry is forced to bid so aggressively that they may be taking on too much risk. So uh, what can you do to ensure that a company does not in fact take so much risk on that uh, the whole thing can fall apart? Well, I think, uh, I think some of the things I talked about address that. And I th I'm sure industry would agree. Uh, if I'm in industry and I'm still hearing that the requirements are not final on the program or that the um, source selection criteria are moving around and I'm investing or planning to invest a lot of my money on a concept, I'm trying to hit a moving target. So for us in the, on, on our side, we need to not make it a moving target. We hear all the time, tell us what it is, tell us your criteria, give us a couple of years and stick to it. And that's what we really intend to do. I think the Air Force has been really good in the last few years of not changing requirements on its programs. We gotta continue with the discipline, but then we have to do the next thing. We have to establish them early enough to give industry a chance so they're not at risk. If I was somebody in industry right now and I didn't know what the program was gonna be, I'd be really hanging out there if I put a lot of my money into it, if, I st if the requirements are still changing around. So that's what we have to do. Um, I also think that um, industries probably needs to see things like the Air Dominance 2030 initiative. Part of one of the reasons, the value of doing that, is it's gonna show industry, this is where we're headed. This, if you wanna invest your money, you may not invest your money on any one specific program, but if you see where we're trying to go in Air Dominance, that's an area to invest. Um, I think it's not right for, if anybody comes to us and says, here's an idea, and for us to say, well, how would that be used? We should be the ones showing industry where, what we're thinking, so that you can do your investment. So that's how I'd answer that. The other one uh, concerning risk came out of a panel yesterday afternoon. The last one had to do with technology innovation. And the concern was that uh, a risk aversion is stifling innovation. So uh, the fear that there is no room for failure reduces the ability of industry to take technological leaps forward because there is no willingness to take that kind of a risk. What's your Well, it's comment? a key po problem, right? We say that all the time. We say we're too risk averse. And then we say, who are you holding accountable for that DARPA thing that failed? Those two don't go together. 
The other thing I, we have to remind ourselves, and I heard this line from Bran Farron, some of you know him. He said, we have an Air Force today because the Army could not do technology transfer. So think about it for a second. You want to you wanna be risky? You want to be risky? Don't innovate. I mean, I, I, it's, pretty, it's pretty scary with the innovation that's happening out there around the world. So um, that's one thing. The second thing, and this gets back to experimentation. You know, I, I, I and a few others on the Defense Science Board studied experimentation a lot before I came into this job. And one thing you find out is to do experimentation right, you need to do a campaign of experimentation because you're going to fail things. But failing is learning. You've got to find out what doesn't work, not just what works. And you've got to remind people that the goal is learning and innovating, not pass-fail. And so it's, it's discipline, it's doing a campaign, and it's, and it's frankly also top cover. Because, but if we don't innovate, we will, uh, and we don't do tech transfer, we're in trouble. Good, thank you. I also had two questions, uh, both related to the viability of the defense industrial base. Um, and what kind of responsibility does the government the Air Force have to make sure that we retain a viable defense industrial base, and uh, how do you go about doing that? The, the first is easy. It is our, indeed our responsibility to do it. The second is the harder one is how. The, the dilemma you have is that you, um, on an individual source selection, you have to make it about the criteria of that individual source selection, and you shouldn't do it any other way. But then you have to look at the broad set of source selections. And by the way, it's not just the ones happening in the Air Force. It's what's happening, in, in, let's say, in the Navy at the same time. And take a step back and say, oh, wait a second here. If, let's, play the, let's do a, a bracket. Let's do an NCAA bracket thing and see what's the possibility of where, let's say, we lose one fundamental industrial partner in a certain area. And then what do we do to mitigate that? So frankly, we have to put together, I think, hedging strategies. We can't, we can't direct individual source selections, but we have to put hedging strategies and how we space programs out across the services so that if a certain scenario happens, that there's at least a catch up so that we don't push one industry partner out of the market inadvertently. That's hard to do. I know Frank Kendall's very interested in that. One of the reasons behind all this aerospace initiatives and air dominance is the industrial base. That's one of the reasons we're very concerned, but it is our responsibility. Good, thank you. Um, maybe one more here. Um, with the emphasis on industrial funded uh, RFD, how does that complement your priority of owning the technical baseline, and how does industry protect their intellectual property? Yeah, so th this is the constant tension we have. Is uh, when, we, when I talked earlier about owning the technical baseline, occasionally people will say, well, gee, are you trying to get our IP? And the answer is no, no, we don't want your IP. We're not trying to get it. Um, I'm not saying that sometimes people in the government haven't asked for IP that they shouldn't have asked for. I'm sure that has happened. It's not what we want to do. It's, industry has to be clear to us to tell us what is the, what's their line on IP. On the same time, we have to be assertive with industry and say, but that's not an excuse not to do an open architecture. Okay, so the question about the IRAD, how I, what, what I would think is that as we show the air dominance work we're doing, I would hope folks would tailor their IRADs to fit in to that, to that, uh, that work. When I was at, uh, in, in the organizations I used to work in, we had a saying, and I, I'm a, I probably should say it here, but what the heck. We used to do IRAD to embarrass the government. So what I mean by that is you'd look at, you'd look at a certain warfare and you say, geez, what's, duh, they're missing this. And you just do an IRAD on it and you show it to them and then somebody grabs it and it's not your IRAD anymore, it's direct funded. So that's how they should be using an IRAD. Sir, thank you very much thank for you. this great presentation. Uh, we appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you.